everyone and welcome to the meeting of the people overview. Before we start, I need to inform you that this meeting has been live streamed and recorded. We have apologies for absence from Charles Lyons from the Diocese of Hereford, Councillor Kevin Hurley, who has been substituted by Edward Towers. Does anybody have, anybody have any disclosable, disclosable person? Pecuniary interest? No? Before we go into the actual meeting, I'd just like, I may on behalf of this group, to send a uh, big congratulations to our children's education services team and what they've had to go through for the last two years and how they've coped with all their problems and to turn around and come out with a good offset. I think it's absolutely superb. So well done to everybody. OK. Uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 17th November. Can I have a proposal? Seconder? Anybody? Anything to? Yes, Hilary. I said a second. Oh, sorry, Darren. <laughs> Just because. <laughs> okay. Uh, no public questions, but we have a member question. Would you like to ask your question, Ruth? Regarding the um, it's regarding the uh, findings of the Children's Commissioner for England, who um, published interim findings earlier this month regarding the number of children not in school and not in education. And um, specifically, I'd like to to um, know how many of that that sat in Shropshire. So, the full question is. The Children's Commissioner for England published her interim findings early this month on her attendance audit. These interim findings indicate the significant <coughs> number of children not in school. It also reports that many local authorities do not have an accurate record of the number of children that there are in England, let alone the number not receiving education. Could the portfolio holder confirm to this committee how many children are in Shropshire of preschool age, primary school age and secondary school age and confirm how these records were obtained, reviewed and checked for accuracy? Will the portfolio holder also confirm how many children in Shropshire are not attending school, including those educated at home, and what support is being <coughs> provided to ensure that all Shropshire children receive an education? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Helson, for your for, for your question. It's quite a detailed um, response which will be circulated to all uh, committee members. Um, so preschool age, we've got 14,788 um, age 0 to 4. Primary school age 23,835, that's 5 to 11 year olds. Primary school age 28,507, that's 11 to 18 year olds. The population information provided above is from the Office of National Statistics Population Estimates for Shropshire, last updated in April 2021. Locally, we use a combination of data sets to track our ch ch children's population. As preschool children, we are in receipt of birth data on a quarterly basis, along with annual GP registrations, data twice yearly. Together, these form the known children data, which is used during the forecasting of known children for each school catchment area. At school age, the population is monitored via the school census and the education management system. It should be noted that whilst we aim to capture 100% of children in the county, there can be no guarantee of this. People moving in and out of the county may not amend their GP registrations, enrol at a new school or inform the authority of their arrangements. In these instances, professional curiosity and robust tracking arrangements outlined in the children missing education section are used to identify and chase children of statutory school age who reside in Shropshire. 
for the second part to that question. In the first half term of 2022, um, 1st of January to the 8th of February, the national average for attendance was 88.6%, with the Shropshire average for the same period being 89.1%, based on the DfE attendance portal return. Week by week, analysis of this data confirms that Shropshire attendance exceeded the national average in five out of the six weeks of that half term and was above the national average for the key vulnerable groups outlined in the chart below and that was circulated to all members. The average attendance in Shropshire also places children as ranked third out of our 11 statistical neighbours. Whilst we are encouraged by this, particularly <coughs> given the disruption faced because of the pandemic, we are working together to develop a system-wide approach to secure an attendance for all our children and young people in Shropshire, at least to pre-pandemic levels and then improving further. A team of education welfare officers routinely monitor the absent rates of all of our children enrolled in Shropshire schools, the team work closely with children, families and schools to support individuals and whole school attendance, using a variety of interventions to secure the best outcomes for children, including a range of emotional health and wellbeing support through educational psychologists, mental health support team and wider training opportunities. Children missing education are children of compulsory school age, five to 16 years old, who are not registered pupils at a school and are not receiving education otherwise than at a school. Shropshire's missing education data shows us that we have 64 Shropshire resident children, last known addresses in Shropshire, 14 moved out into, Shrop into Shropshire from another local authority area in the process of being placed into a school and was 111 confirmed as moved out of Shropshire, leaving no forward in address. <clears throat> the Education Access Service undertakes a statutory duty to identify children who are not in receipt of education and works in close partnership with other agencies and services <coughs> on behalf of the local authority. Schools are required to notify the local authority of any children who are not enrolled at their school, who are enrolled at their school, sorry, and those who are removed from the school role, including the reason for removal. Education access serves as a robust process in place to track and chase, trace children who are classed as children missing education. To establish they are safe and to ensure they can access a suitable education. Currently, there are 550 children listed in Shropshire as being electively home educated. That's 183 primary age and 367 secondary age. The numbers had already been increasing before the COVID pandemic, but we saw a 24% increase in 2021. This reduced by 23% in the autumn 21, but we are seeing a steady increase again in the spring term of 2022. The Ofsted inspection that's been recently undertaken has said that effective tracking systems allow leaders to have oversight of those children who are missing education and those who are home educated. These systems lead to escalation to the Education Welfare Service when elective home education is not in the children's best interest in terms of promoting their welfare or when children are missing. This service works closely with parents and children to ensure that children's welfare is promoted. So very detailed response there, members, but I will make sure you get a copy of this today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Tammy. That's a really comprehensive response. And I think it was important to have that in the, yeah. in the public domain, actually, given the, yeah. the national picture. Um, um, 64 children missing education is still probably 64 too many. And it's concerning that people move out of county and move in without sort of registering or even forwarding addresses. So any work around that would be really welcome, I think, to make sure that young people are educated. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. 
Okay, fine. Right. 96 is over to Sonia. Morning, Sonia. Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. Um, I hope everybody can hear me OK, because I have had some technical issues this morning, so shout if you can't. Um, Daniel's very kindly going to share the um, report for me on the screen. Um, hopefully you've had this, but um, we've been asked to attend um, People's Overview Committee this morning to give you an update on the Stepping Stones project, which most of you will know of in some way, shape or form. You're probably aware that um, Stepping Stones was um, originally agreed um, in the financial um, agreements two years ago, um, but then COVID hit and we had some delay in getting Stepping Stones off the ground. But we finally managed to start the project effectively of March last year and formally launched it at the end of June, at mid beginning of middle of June last year um, in 2021. Stepping Stones is an investor save project and the investment is a kind of total of three million over three years to evidence that we can um, work with children and young people both on the edge of care um, and um, those that are already looked after to step them down and out um, fu fundamentally to make sure that we get the right outcome for those children but that actually we can effectively show that we can demonstrate financial savings in relation to this. Daniel if you can move the screen on for me. Daniel, can you move the screen on? Yeah, it just says a few seconds lag, so bear with it. Sorry, sorry. OK, so the project is based on the North Yorkshire No Wrong Door model, and the significance of that is that that is, um, has been an, an evaluated project. So the model that is used by North Yorkshire has been fully evaluated um, across the partnership that work with um, that and the impact and the outcomes on children and young people. Um, they successfully demonstrated that working in a different way to work with some of those children and young people either at risk of becoming looked after or already who were um, did successfully improve the safety and stability of children and young people by having a right people at the right place at the right time approach. So we've called it stepping stones and it is a slightly amended model because what we've been able to do is utilize the residential um, sort of resources that we have to support and underpin phase one, phase two and phase three of stepping stones. So we've combined it with the residential um, expansion improvement project that council also approved a number of years ago. So the purpose of stepping stones is to reduce the number of children requiring high cost residential placements. At the start, this was 65. Um, we fluctuate around that number still, but we focus on the avoidances at the moment because obviously when we set up stepping stones, we weren't expecting COVID and the pandemic. We want to show and demonstrate a total savings and avoidance target over the three years of 6.285 million pounds. We want to increase the number of children being able to safely return to live with their family or a foster family if they're stepping down out of residential care and provide holistically psychologically informed approach which provides wraparound individualized support to children, young people and adults in families where it's needed and to reframe the view and use of residential care where essentially we change that view to a short term intervention when it's needed rather than a long term solution to the care of children and young people. And we aim to address issues of placement availability and quality. You'll be aware that there is a national issue in relation to high cost placements around the availability, the quality and the effective impact of those placements. Thank you, Daniel. Um, the project is based around a multidisciplinary hub approach within a resident residential setting. So we are working at the moment to develop a resource at Havenbrook. Um, and I think there's more detail of that later on, um, which is our short breaks unit. Um, and we're looking to develop Chal Marin, one of our children's homes, longer term into um, a sort of short to medium term home. We currently have young people living there long term and we can't do that until they're ready to move on at a time that's right for them. The third part of the residential aspect is the new home of Care Bryn, which will be focusing on the transition of young people 16 to 18. 
So Stepping Stones has um, is recruiting foster carers who will be in tra trained to a much more enhanced level to work with children and young people who are stepping down and out of residential, which is a higher cost. And the three main areas of focus of the project is parenting support with links to the community and an early help offer so that we can avoid children becoming looked after. Edge of Care, the multidisciplinary team will offer a whole family systemic approach to work with those children who are really at risk of becoming looked <clears> after <throat> and step down out of those high cost placements. Um, as we say, it came a year later than planned, but the investment was 2.66 million over three years, plus the £150,000 capital for the therapeutic space, which is what's being um, developed at Havenbrook. Daniel? Can we move on, Daniel. It's just taking a little while to. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I'll talk to the next slide. There it goes. OK, so um, there are a range of reasons why children end up in very high cost residential placements. Um, and when we talk about high cost, the average at the moment for us is around 4000 a week. Um, but it varies greatly depending on what the complexity of need is. The complex disabilities, there are some young people, um, those that result in physically and aggressively challenging behaviours and those that require very low sensory stimulation environments. Children with those complex disabilities do struggle to live in family environments and they need a very adapted um, approach and they are result in high cost placements. Children who have experienced high levels of severe childhood trauma and who find relationships very difficult and they cannot manage the intensity of a family environment. And children whose needs may have gone unmet over a number of years and have not had the right support at the right time to address those needs. And then mental health issues that have not been identified and supported and children require high levels of support and supervision to keep them safe from themselves and sometimes from others. So Stepping Stones is developing a therapeutic <coughs> approach. Um, it's holistic and psychologically informed, which provides wraparound customised support <coughs> for children, young people and the adults. And this is what's different about the approach for Stepping Stones, is it is as much <coughs> focused on working with the parents and their own unresolved issues, often trauma issues, um, and that how that impacts on their parenting, as it is around working with the child or the rest of the brothers and sisters within the family, um, if it's one child that's problematic. So the systemic aspect is that it takes a whole family, um, look at the dynamics and the relationships, but also looks at the role of school, the wider environment, extended family within that whole family system. The skills um, and experience of our systemic social workers are being disseminated across the Stepping Stones community via training and skill sharing. So it's very much about upskilling a number of people that work with that family so that everybody works in a very consistent way. The team has so far attended training on restorative practice, systemic training, managing challenging behaviour, county lines awareness, finding my voice, the graded care profile, motivational interviewing, supervision for team managers, neglect training from the our local safeguarding partnership, how to engage families, team treats training, Solihull approach and DDP, um, all of which are psychologically informed and obviously that gives the teams that are working with these families a very wide range of knowledge, skills, understanding and therapeutic inputs to be able to use the right one for the right family at the right time. The clinical psychologist and speech and language therapists have been a bit of a challenge to recruit to, but we've made significant progress in relation to that. Um, and the psychologist is out to advert and the speech and language therapist will follow shortly. The original plan um, has put um, stepping stones into sort of two phases, one to recruit specific roles with the project manager and an operational manager and develop the pathways and the implement of the robust outreach therapeutic model based at Havenbrook um, and the recruitment of the therapeutic foster carers and then development phase two is development of the physical hub which is the use of the residential care home um, which is an interdependency with care in which is the transitional care home and progress work towards children step children out of care and monitor the outcomes of children and cost avoiding savings for those services. We're at this phase where phase one is up and running and is effective and phase <coughs> two 
um, is starting to kind of like merge and grow and develop. It has been hampered obviously significantly by COVID. So the milestones that we've achieved um, in phase one is the setting up of the stepping stones teams. That's 80 percent achieved. And as I say, that relies on the recruitment of the psychologist and the speech and language therapist to complete training the stepping stones team um, because we've had some staff changes that remains 80 percent achieved. But, but the vast majority of the staff have had that wide range of training. Facilitating the pathways into the project, producing a clear process process for the pathway for children at all stages of need, approaching care on the edge of care and in those in care. The 20% not achieved is focused much more on the kind of step down to the foster care element because we've yet to um, finalise and recruit um, and actually have one child um, achieve that particular route. Um, formulating the stepping stones therapeutic approach again is described as being 80% achieved because that's still um, developing and once we've got the clinical psychologist and the speech and language therapist <coughs> we'll be able to um, finalise what that wider range of therapeutic um, work looks like with those two roles. The conversion of buildings at Havenbrook Outreach work to be undertaken. At the time of writing it was 50% achieved and that's because we'd had to have a delay and we'd have to had a halt to works um, for a few weeks because of a child placed there. Um, I'm pleased to say that that work is back up and running. Um, the therapeutic spaces are nearly complete and about to be furnished and the conversion of the office space um, and the team space is commencing and should be complete within the next 12 to 16 weeks. Um, forging the partnerships and the collaborative working. This has been an area that's been a bit more of a challenge. We've got a lot of support verbally from our partners across health um, and various other sort of police, education, etc. But actually being able to um, turn that into a physical contribution, whether that be financial or of people with skills, has been a lot more challenging and continues to be an area of focus for the board. Um, the monitoring of the outcomes of the project. Um, we have a really robust monitoring um, system in place to monitor those outcomes. And we've classed that as 25% achieved because obviously we're only a year in. And so we've got that monitoring that outcome, but it's early stages <coughs> in evidencing that impact. Recruitment of the Stepping Stones carers and the training of the Stepping Stones foster carers, as I say, is not yet achieved and it remains work in progress with the marketing and recruitment um, officer for our foster carers. Thank you, Daniel. So I'll wait for the slide to come up, but I'll start to talk to it. Um, once the project we set the project up, we had quite clear um, aims and targets for the first year and uh, across the whole of the life of the project. So the life of the project <coughs> sought to have 15 total placements being avoided, i.e. children not needing to become looked after and 15 step down from residential to internal foster care or to reunify them home. The overall aim was to avoid 6.3 million in spend from the budget, from the placements budget. In year one, we had targets which were three avoidances, which saving 358,000 and three step downs from residential saving 340,000, a total savings target of 698,400 in year one. As of the 28th of February, um, the team have significantly exceeded those targets. We currently have 1.961 million avoidance savings reflecting 26 children that we've cost avoided, avoided them becoming looked after, six successful step downs um, from residential to other fostering placements, not the therapeutic ones because obviously we haven't recruited to those yet, and two short term but untime, ultimately unsuccessful step downs from residential or fostering placements. So the savings achieved in year were 1.961 million against the target of 0.69 <coughs> and that means that the original savings target has been surpassed by 1.2 million this year. If we were to replace that as a full year effect across the savings target that would and across a full year have saved 4.519 million. This is against the actual project revenue expend totaling 608,000 with a forecast annual underspend of 89,000 and a half 
thousand this year, primarily due to the recruitment delays in the clinical psychologist. Thank you, Daniel. So, in terms of informing per people's overview committee of um, the kind of placement cost that I mentioned earlier, that our average placement cost is around four thousand. The exact figure is four thousand four hundred and seven. Um, the average mother and baby external residential placement, which is often a 12 week assessment, is just over 4,000. Our own internal residential homes come out at an average cost of 6,055. Our internal foster care come out at 389 pounds. Average external foster care is 813 pounds and our average supported accommodation. So our 16 pluses who move on into a more structured supported accommodation environment is £1,721. So you can see that there is a significant cost associated to these children who are in our <coughs> high cost external provision. Our average internal residential cost is higher because we have um, children who are in two bedded homes and single bed homes because we are caring for the more complex children um, in our own homes because we are concerned about the quality um, of the external provision quite often and you'll know that our um, internal homes are graded good or outstanding at the moment by Ofsted. Thank you Daniel. So we've got a slide here which um, demonstrates visually the sort of stepping stone team structure. We have a service manager who oversees the project and an operations manager who's supported by business support. <clears throat> and we have two senior social workers who are highly skilled. One of them works with um, the children's side of the therapeutic work and the other <clears throat> is skilled as an adult senior social worker and their background is working with adults. They then have a senior outreach worker that works with them and a small team of outreach workers each that work underneath them. Those outreach workers are skilled in working with both the children and the adults so that the families can have some consistency, but mostly there are separate workers that work with the children and the adults to, so that those relationships don't conflict, but they work very closely together as a team. The Stepping Stones then has the access to our family group conferencing, so we look to seek um, on the, um, the strengths of the wider family and extended family. And we have the, obviously a project structure around the um, project <coughs> as well. So, um, so just in summary here, um, we've given you the kind of targets so far. But in total, the team have looked at seeing and identified a potential 220 children in the last year and held 220 um, case discussion consultations. They've progressed um, 150 of those children for some form of stepping <coughs> stone support. 66 children received continued um, support and 51 children have closed with a outer cost saving. Um, that's an obviously an identifiable cost saving, but obviously what that has done is prevented 14 children from risks escalating um, and 17 other children um, who have had assessment and support and 20 families who chose not to participate in the project. The challenges for the project have been about recruiting those dedicating staff and partner agencies um, and <coughs> ensuring buy in from partners um, that it's not just about participation, but also the financial contribution and, and to get dedicated staff contributions to a multidisciplinary project. Thank you, Daniel. So what is different about Stepping Stones, as I've kind of identified, is that the, it's the multi-agency aspect that will be different. So whilst we've struggled to get the, the sort of specialist health provision um, on board, the hub does work with the child's school, um, with any other professional that's work involved with them, whether that be a youth offending worker or, um, a, you know, the community police officers, etc. So the multi-agency hub model works very much as a team around that <coughs> child, and that family, and that can include the support that's available to the parents when that's needed. They hold fortnightly hub meetings with the partner agencies, um, including health, education, police, housing, and then the aim is to share information in a timely manner and get the right support from the right partner agency into that family in the most effective way. 
there's a lot of signposting work that happens, but equally there is a lot of direct work that also happens. So with our future developments and the aspirations is to build on the success of the model and to aim to significantly upscale it. If we could upscale this by twice or third, three times, you can see the number of children and the families that we could reach. And obviously the aim, ultimate aim of that is to get the right <coughs> out for children and families, but to really address the significant financial challenge we have here in Shropshire around the cost of residential placements. Um, to ensure that um, the multi-agency partnership, in particular our health colleagues who are working with us to try and achieve this, ensure a trauma-informed practice model that's supported by clinical expertise so that all of our health provision across the partnership and across the system does operate in a trauma-informed way so that parents and children can access it. Um, focus on the prevention of escalation and using a joined up approach and the use of data intelligence to try and predict and target the right children and families. That's a real aspiration and early help are working very much on that model and we hope to work in partnership with them <coughs> to try and um, use that kind of data intelligence to make sure that we're working with the right families. And we really want to be a local authority and a children's services that delivers on the vision that children are best cared for at home where it's safe to do so or within an alternative family environment where we can. We've got an aspirational target of reducing um, the, the high cost residential placements from 64 to 15, which is massively aspirational, but we believe to 20 to 25 children being remaining in res high cost residential over five years is an achievable target. Um, so what we need um, from the council is the support for the vision and the service development from members as well as seniors officers. We've got great support from um, councillor Nick Bardsley who sits on our board <coughs> at Stepping Stones, um, but also to sort of promote this project in the wider um, environments for members where you attend. Um, we need a system wide commitment to the vision that our partner agencies also understand that residential is not always the best option for children and young people um, and that the whole system across the partnership does understand the financial impact of the current model on both uh, childhood and adulthood. Many of these children who live in residential care long term become high um, users of the services as adults as well. It doesn't always lead to them being able to live successfully and independently in the community as adults. Um, the whole system needs to commit to the right support at the right time for the prevention and a joint service delivery culture where we are all working in a trauma informed way. And the bar barriers of the contribution of staff skills and finance from our partner agencies we need to address. We've got agreement in principle to move to a programme management approach to look at a detailed upscaling from the local authority perspective and from the senior leaders across health um, and um, our other partners, um, but we have yet to move to that to actually being an active program management um, delivery model at the moment. So just as a very brief overview of what we actually do with families, um, the work is much more intensive than the, the sort of standard social work intervention we have. It's up to seven days a week and often several hours a day if necessary, and that does depend on what the family need at the time. The first visit we check with the family what support that they feel that they need um, and what they want, and we review that after 12 weeks to support them in their views of what needs to actually change. When a family is in crisis, we provide a timely response and that includes evenings and weekends. So if they do have a challenging scenario, they get the response at the time that they need the support, not having to wait for um, the office hours. The consultations that take place multidisciplinary enable us to gather a really brief but detailed overview and decide if the family is in the right place and is the right family to embark 